we have traveled up to i don't know if you might recognize this hog barn we're at this will do farm we're going to be kind of touring hog facilities learning about the technology and what it's like to uh be a contract grower it's gonna be fun to actually learn a little more about pig farming which i know very little about <laughs> come on in <laughs> welcome to it we promise that wasn't staged at all <laughs> tork sawyer this will do this will do farm yep not that'll do farm which i i was, the the I was like i'm like that's a smart name they <laughs> named it after babe it was like but i was wrong so this will do farm yeah uh that's youtube yep. TikTok, TikTok, instagram facebook kills the game on TikTok. kills the game on hey, TikTok. Appreciate that. really good stuff really good video editing and uh barn talk podcast we will be on that we'll film it a little bit later after we get done running through and doing all this stuff as you can tell i'm looking real fashionable in some coveralls because first thing we got to do when we come into these barns is biosecurity you guys yeah. want to talk about biosecurity real quick yeah so in finishing it's not as of a it's not as big of a deal as it is in the sow unit but we still have biosecurity things that we have to abide by and we got our coveralls on we have our over here, when you walk in, you gotta have a clean, dirty line in every single one of your, your finishers. And we don't have a line, but pretty much we've made a line where the grade is, where that stops, that's where you should take all your stuff off. And when you come in, you have all your stuff off, you have your boots off, you come over here. Then we got another clean, dirty line where we kind of keep all the boots here. And you know, you try your best to do that. Um, and putting these grates in, you don't, these aren't required. But we, we think it's a really nice deal. We did it in this barn uh, because we can wash our boots off. We can kind of keep all the mess in one place and not track it throughout the workroom. Um, and that's really what we try to do. Don't bring any disease into the barn. Uh, if people, visitors come to this site or any of our sites, if they've been around pigs from another integrator or if they grow pigs from themselves, we try to tell them to, obviously they're gonna have to follow the biosecurity measurements that I showed you but uh, they gotta not be around pigs for at least 24 hours so they don't bring any disease in the barn. Cause that's all we're trying to do with biosecurity is not track disease around and get pigs sick. So this is a loading chute. This is where we load pigs out, get pigs in, that door flips up, and we'll put our panels in here when we gotta do sorting or loading or anything, but yeah. And like what, what size barn is this? I, uh, 2400, it's, it's the exact same design as my dad's down there okay. that we're going to go to after this. Okay. People that don't know what a contract grower is, tell them what a contract grower yeah, is. Yeah, so essentially these aren't our pigs. We we grow pigs for, a, for an integrator. We have built these barns to grow out their pigs and finish them out as full grown hogs. So we're a lean to finish contract grower. They pay us so much of pig space to do that for them. And so essentially they're kind of renting our space and we're taking care of their pigs. It's been a real good deal. Uh, it's treated my family well and a lot of families out there well. And so. in your barn we have pretty close to market weight. Yeah, so these are actually market sized pigs. And you can see that those actually are marked because we're gonna be selling pigs Sunday night. So we're selling out three loads Sunday night. And so we've already taken some pigs out of here already. So these are the big boys and girls. Um, What's the weight on these things? These are probably 290 to 300 pounds. Marked ones that you see right now, the, market, the marking crew has already came through and they mark the lights. When you start, when a marking crew starts, they come in, there's, there's probably going to be more light pigs than there are fat hogs and they'll mark the fat hogs. But when you get to this point where most of the pigs are fatties and they're going out, they're going to mark what's less than a pen. So they're going to mark the lights. I bet that's really fun when you get into like half to load out multiple barns tonight. It's like, okay, they got the light ones or the heavy ones marked yeah. on this one. Which one are we Communication. Keep the marks or leave the marks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's some fatties. Definitely some fatties. So usually, usually we have our pens set up where there's four pens running together after the nursery stage. So when they first come in as wiener pigs, we have these gates shut to the individual pigs. Once we, we take overstocks out and we kind of transition from the nursery stage to, to the finishing stage, the wiener pig to Peter pig, then we open up all these pens with four pens running together. Dude, what, as a wiener pig, that's not a hot dog pig. <laughs> might become a hot dog pig, but it, it's a small pig, what weight is that? Like 15, 20, 25 pounds. And market weight? 290 to 300 pounds. How long does that take? 
So first cuts, it takes anywhere from five to six months. If it's, if it's really growing, they're really growing, probably four and a half months, first cuts will go out. The entirety of a group is six months. So six months. six months. So you'll have your overachievers that go out five months or four and a half months, and then at the end, it'll be around six months. How long do you have in between groups? It, that really depends. So it just depends on the flow of the integrator. If they have pigs, if they need barn space, and they really got it, and they got sow units that are producing piglets, you know, they'll say, you got three days, five days. Oh. I'd say three to five days, you gotta get a barn turned around. Right here, we'll actually look at the, the next barn, uh, but you got two different styles of feeders. Yeah. You got a wet, wet dry feeder, yeah, is that what so they call it? a wet dry feeder. Molly won't come into the pigs because she got like tackled as a fair queen or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they're... You'll have to ask her about that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, so these are wet dry, so, my dad has dry feeders in all of his barns, and that was that's kind of the industry standard. But we're really trying to make our manure, manure quality the best it can. And when you have cups, some of that, a lot of that water just gets into the pit, yep. you know, and it kind of deludes your manure quality. And they get feed; they all get it here. Granted, you're going to have more feeder pad feeder pad wear. So, like my feeder pads, they've had. This will be their fourth group, and they're already starting to wear. Yeah, you can already you see can already it's kind not of see. smooth there anymore, yeah. It's just because they get all the traction. Versus my dad's barn, he's got that water cup here, and he's got his dry feed here. So I feel better about, I won't have as much wear on my slats here, but I will have more wear on my feeder pad. But overall, I think the benefits outweigh the cons because our manure quality is better. And they're all in one spot. I don't have as much slat wear, so. And I don't have to really, I haven't had much trouble with them, nipple-wise, them breaking or anything like that. The benefits being a contract grower is you don't take as much risk on as the guys that are the integrators. You don't own the pigs, so you're really not beholden to the commodities market, whatever hogs are, and you're really not beholden to what how high corn is because you're not the one feeding the pigs. So the integrator provides all the veterinarian, uh, services, the vets come in, they provide all the uh, antibiotics that we would need if we ever needed to treat some pigs. They provide um, the vaccinations that the pigs need if we need to give them vaccinations. Um, and they provide all the feed that we feed the pigs. So those are all great things. Yeah, you're not, you're not gonna make what you could make on a really great year when pigs are high, but you're also not gonna be losing your ass at the same time. So. Um, and that's kind of where we've gotten as an industry, and I bet Dad will touch on that a little bit of kind of the history of that. But um, there's a lot of pros to doing it, um, and it's, it's treat like I said before, it's treated our family really, really well. Without the hog business, I would have never been here. I would have never been able to be a farmer. I would never, I wouldn't have had enough to do, or I couldn't have sustained my my life if I wouldn't have had the hog business. So. Um, it's, I'm glad that we got into it because now we have we can sustain two generations in a farm and dad and I can kind of farm together. So it's been a good deal. The ones that are marked now are the light ones yep. that are staying. Yep, those are the ones staying. They'll, they'll stay to grow a little bit bigger. That must be like an important thing to have the ideal weights because realistically the Packers an assembly line yes. and they want everything to be yeah, so they the have same a weight, size. They have a weight ratio that like that was the whole idea with COVID when these packers shut down and these and these pigs got way too big people were getting pissed because they saw some farmers having to euthanize animals well the problem was a lot of these packing plants were set up for a certain size a pig and if that pig got way too big and their snout touched the the floor of the assembly line and it wasn't fda approved you know that surface that that pig touched wasn't fda approved well then now they can't sell or process that pig. These are our rubber mats that we use and we only use these when we have wiener pigs. We take these mats off and we set them right in front of the feeder pads. And it's a really good way to get our, we'll get our feed scoop and we put some feed on the mat. And it's a really good way to get those wiener pigs started to get used to kind of eating that feed. And we kind of put the mat here for a reason because we want them to get used to the idea of coming up to that feeder kind of put it all in one one place <laughs> when they get used to eating out of the feeder they'll start just chewing on the rubber mat so you don't want to ruin them put these boards up put some hooks on them and we were like you know what 
instead of dragging these mats out one by one through the loading chute and putting them on a putting them on the skid loader, why don't we try hanging them off the wall? That so works. That worked. That was that was a good idea. Come on, by. Sometimes they just get a little too much. So these are nipple bars, and so we put these down as well when they're wiener pigs when they first come in. It's just there's nipples on these waters, so okay. it's just like the, it's just like their mama, and it's a really good way to get them used to drinking water. So we have these. We we'll put these down when they're wiener pigs. We'll also have water in the feeder that will be on, so they just it's another way to get them get them some water and get them used to drinking. So it changes your amount of time that you got to spend in your barn yes. each day. Yes. Probably a lot more labor intensive with the wiener pigs. In the beginning, yes. Yeah. How long do you? Think you have to be in the barn on a wiener pig like so it really depends on the herd health you know the herd health the pig's health how the barn is if you got to come in here and you got to treat pigs you got to pull pigs you got to move pigs that takes more time but if you have a really healthy group and you know you're not mat feeding anymore i'd say anywhere from three to six hours not just in one barn, but like to do all work. of the sites, all the sites. Three to six hours for all. But when you get into this stage where the pigs are healthy, they're getting ready to go to market, the biggest time is sorting and loading pigs. So. so then as a contract grower, how are you paid? Are you paid bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly? Monthly, 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 yeah, monthly quarterly, pig monthly space. Pay? Yeah, I mean, the in industry standard is probably 42 bucks a pig space is the industry standard. Um, but there's some guys that might pay 43, 44. Depending um, upon location and all Location all also, if an integrator wants a specific type of equipment. Okay. Like if they want a Maximus control system instead of an AP edge controller like it's in my barn, that might cost more. Or if they require bin scales, that's going to be a more cost into the barn when you first build it. So they might pay more. Okay. Uh, they might pay more per space because they expect more, I guess, in how much you put into the barn. So we're going to head out of this barn and we're going to head over to one of his dad's barns. Talk about the technology over there and a few other good things. As we go to hop to the next hog barn here, uh, we're gonna stop and check out actually the feed system. So the feed gets delivered on feed trucks. I know that because I see them go by every now. And then they have a big auger boom and they show up any time of night or whenever they come, right? Yep, we give them a three day notice. You, oh, so you have to inform them? So we, every time a bin goes empty, we have an app on our phone and we put it in put in our order for whatever bin and we give them three days notice to get the feed here uh, a worm auger I, uh, yeah it's it's an auger without a, a tube in it basically yeah. each each tube each line is for each feed line so okay two in the south two in the north room we also got bin vibrators on yep. our bins so that and that's that's not an industry standard that's just something that makes our life easier it saves us a bunch of time so we don't have to come out here and beat on the bin. So that's really, really nice. We love our bin vibrators. They vibrate when they need, when when the feed gets hung up in a bin, it detects it and it vibrates and solves the problem and the bin will or the feed will come down. Alright, it's a little warm out here yeah. today, but it's still windy, so we're going to the next barn. Here, talk about Yeah, these. so um it it's the it's the brain of everything. When I was a kid, our barns that we had instead of having this you had like a wall with 25 safety thermostats on it that had a sharpie mark on it this is for this fan this is for this fan this is this fan so all the fans all the heaters all the ventilation the inlets the curtains everything runs out of this box today we calculate how much air we need off the number of pigs so when i tell this control how many pigs we're putting in the barn it figures out how many CFM of air we need to move. And so it adjusts the fans as far as when they're gonna start, how fast they're gonna ramp up, and when we're gonna kick on the next fan based off of the number of pigs we have in there and then the temperature in the building. This box up here is our alarm system, but this is redundant. So in other words, this, this system is redundant of this. So if you ever got the situation where something happened with this controller and say it didn't read right something went wrong with the logic you got a lightning strike whatever and this wasn't doing what it was supposed to we have sensors in the barn that are completely separate from this to where if that 
sense as a problem. I also get a phone call, text message, whatever. So it's peace of mind. And can you access this from like the, this, through your desktop mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Yep. This is the app. So that's the barn talk. This is what oh, yeah. dad was talking about. So that also has its, inter its own interface and it's an app and it lets you know outside temp, temp in the barn, water pressure. This basically took a whole bunch of worry out of the barns. 100%. A whole bunch of worry. So the, the, you can sleep at night. the odds of you losing a barn full of pigs today, I can't say that it's zero because there's always there's always that one goofy thing that could happen, but it it's very rare. Something happened and you couldn't catch it in time. What would be the biggest like issue for losing like a whole uh, air air just the air quality? In the summertime, when we have all the big fans running and the curtain is down, we're moving air from one end of the building through, and as it moves through, it's picking up heat, and then we exhaust it. We're exchanging the air. I used to know this off the top of my head. And don't hold me to this number because I've been out of it long enough I can't remember. But let's just say that you had a two and a half second air, air exchange or a four second air exchange. In other words, from the time that air entered the curtain end until it went out the fans, it took four seconds. Oh my gosh. That's but true. you got to remember you're moving that air over 1,200 head of pigs that are all putting out body heat. Which, and how long is it? Is it like 80 foot? How long is the barn? 200 foot long. 200, yeah, so yeah. longer than I even thought. Yeah. yeah. So, you, as that air moves, it has to pick up all that heat from those pigs to keep the temperature where you want it. Okay, if the power goes out and that air movement stops, that barn is going to heat up very fast. And that's where you need to know if you've got a problem because as long as everything's working, I mean, it's. It's cooler in there than it is outside. It feels great. The pigs don't know it's hot outside, but if those fans stop, you've got a big problem in a hurry. Well, the flip side of that is, in the winter time, we're not moving near as much air because the air we're bringing in is a lot cooler. So you don't have to move as much air to keep the pigs cool. But then, if you lost power, your problem wouldn't be that the barn would overheat. Your problem would be that you have this stagnant uh, block of air and the pigs will just burn up all the oxygen. Yeah. Before you had controls like this and you just had a uh, safety thermostat, if something went wrong, it wouldn't be that the pigs overheated. It would be that they just used up all the oxygen and they all passed out. And how do pigs cool themselves? Do they sweat or do they pant? They pant. They pant. The only part of a pig that sweats is the tip of its nose. Okay. That's it. Okay. which I don't know why that is, but yeah, they just pan. Okay. So in the summer when it's hot, they just lay around and wait for it to cool off. <laughs> kind of like me. Yeah. So this barn has two rooms and each room's identical. Basically, it's like you took two single buildings and you just slid them up tight to one another. So this is 100 feet wide, 200 foot long. If you go through that door, you're in another room just like this one. Okay. So 1,200 on this side? And 1,200 okay. on that side. And so these pigs are about 100 pounds. There's more and more people that built these barns back in the 90s. Those guys are all starting to get old enough that they don't really want to load pigs. So more and more of these integrators are starting to get crews that you can hire to load for you. Um, and we actually use we actually used them for the first time at my site just to do first cuts because we had a lot of stuff going on. And let's face it, I'm not looking for more. <laughs> but anyway, we had them do first cuts. But other than that, uh, we load them all ourselves. Yeah, because you can obviously tell that that guy right there weighs yeah. a whole lot more than that guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, I, I come in here every day and I give them a pep talk and I'm like, you know, you see, you're. You're spending too much time nosing around. You need to call him around. Go to the feeder. I mean, you got to execute. But. So when they show up to you and you guys were saying earlier that you are weaned to finish, yep. do they come with their tails docked? Yes. yes. Yep. And do they still have... Uh, needle teeth. Needle teeth, right? Nope. Is that like been? Meat pulled, oh, they, they pulled cut, them. They cut them. They cut them. Or yeah. I, I didn't know if like that been bred out or some oddball uh, deal, but yeah, I, I kind of remember that that they cut the tail and snip the teeth. Uh huh. Okay. I think they still do that. Although you know what, I'm not 100% sure whether they just 
found a gene that didn't have them so bad or something like well, that? Well, it could be, and or they may just let them go uh, because they they're they're like baby teeth. They they fall out anyway if they oh, let okay. them go far enough. Um, so they may they may not cut them anymore. I don't know, but they have their tails docked when they come. Castrate them. Yep, castrate them if if they're bare or if they're bored. So that's cool. Yeah. So when we get them. We sort them for size, you know, obviously count them, get the same number of pigs in every pen, uh, sort them for size. If there's any that are small, we pull them out. And then we'll we'll leave, there's 40 pens in one of these rooms. And so we'll leave four pens out of 40 empty. And then those are our pull pens. Okay. And so every day when we walk pens, if we find a pig that's falling back. Yeah, this is actually the pull pen right here. This right. is the bottom, 10% of the population. Do your best to help them, but getting them out of the general population is good for the general population, but it's also good for these pigs because you can, you know, keep track of them and, you know, give them special give care. Give them the best chance that you can. Yeah. You know. If Torque was a pig, this is probably the pen that I would have ended up in. <laughs> you, you would have been that guy right there. That would have been the one, hey, follow him around to the trough. Yeah, yeah. So we're standing on top of a slat floor, yep. which the pit's below this. How deep of a pit? Eight foot. Eight foot. It's eight foot deep pit, and roughly it'll hold a million gallons. Which a million gallons, probably different to you were saying, like just feeder run to three groups a year. Yeah. The way you do it, how is that a whole year's worth of manure, oh, yeah. or is it a little longer than that? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't, you ever get? You don't ever get full. So it would be a year and a half. A year uh, and a half. So you got some grace. Yeah. So we typically haul about uh, a little over half. So we'll typically haul about five hundred and fifty thousand gallons out of each one of these barns a year. So it's, it's a little over half full. And so like back home, manure is like worth a lot, and with more barns around here, is the manure still a valuable asset, or is it kind of an issue yeah. thing? No, it's you. You don't have any trouble getting rid of it. If you, if you can't utilize it all yourself, there are all kinds of people that will buy it. Yep. But there's enough of it that you're not going to get somebody to pay you more than what the cost of hauling is. Okay. So people will buy it for the cost of the hauling, and you basically get rid of it for nothing. Okay. But I don't know of anybody around here that is selling it for the nutrient value over the cost of hauling. And so up until, well, including, up until this past year, we have applied three barns worth of manure on our ground, and the fourth barn we've given away. But we're going to all corn. We're gonna plant corn on corn on everything. And the reason we're doing that is because we, the guy that applies our manure has that new John Deere system that analyzes it as it's being pumped. Oh, yeah. So we know exactly the nutrient value as it's being applied. And we can be pretty precise about what we're getting on. And it's too valuable in my mind to give away. And I can grow as good corn on corn in our no-till ground as I can corn on bean ground. So I feel like that it's more valuable to me to keep the manure and just grow corn. So that's, we're gonna try it, see how it goes. Which they, I listened to one of their podcasts, you'll have to check out, who was the guest that- Russ uh, Berry. Russ Berry? Berry. I'll put yeah. that, I'll put that in the description. Like I was really excited about that, where he was trying to dehydrate the manure, which the manure has a lot of water in it get the water out and then he was talking about recycling the water so yeah, like, water back in and putting the water back in and, and then essentially you could ship off the manure which would be a huge bump for you yeah. guys because then oh, you're yeah. selling then you're easily being able to yeah. sell your product yeah it's basically the same it's basically the same consistency as like turkey manure but it's pelletized to where it's even you can even get it dialed in as far as your application there's very little variance so it's that's a really amazing technology. If they can get that to where it's cost effective for medium sized growers, it'll be a and, game changer. And the other thing is, we all want to talk about sustainability and our carbon footprint and all that. If you get to the point that you're sequestering the carbon from that manure and you're recycling all that water, I mean. And the place said no to going into a pit. <laughs> 
three of the four barns that we have are all the same. Sawyer's is different because his is the newest. So all of these barns have what we call, it's a box feeder, it's a dry feeder, and then a cup water. So the pigs, they get their feed from the feeder, and then they go to get a drink. There's two cups per pen, or when we're running four pens together, there's eight cups. And what you'll see is, They'll go back and forth. And that's why these pads look like this. Because they eat and then they're thirsty and they get a drink and then they're hungry. And the salt that's in the feed and the mineral, they dribble it out and, it's and it just wears. The and this is where it wears, right on there. So this barn hasn't been epoxy yet and on the slab. So obviously we're in here kind of disturbing them right now, but like what like a, in 24 hours like a pig eats what percentage of those hours sleeps what percentage of those hours and just yeah. like so they're, they're like newborn babies they eat take a crap go take a nap eat pretty take much. A crap, go take a, yeah so typically they're a lot like us in the fact that in in a with the exception of the really hot part of the year they'll sleep during the night um they don't move much during the night. If you look at our water meters, the water usage, um, it'll drop down pretty low overnight. And then in the morning, when you come in here in the morning, we usually tour between oh, 6 and 8 a.m. right in there. They'll be very similar to, to where they are right now. They'll all be up, they'll all be going, they all wanna eat. And then they'll settle back down. And then middle of the day, they'll be up. And then they'll settle back down and then usually right about the time that you're just a little bit before sunset is when they're the most active so if you come in here like at three o'clock in the afternoon it's like a racetrack i mean they're like wound for sound that's like the social hour and then they eat and then they start winding down and by 10 o'clock at night you'll come in here and they're pretty much just mellowed out pretty much everything you know everything about these buildings is designed they're constantly doing research on basically what makes a pig happy that they want to eat and they want to grow yeah. and that's that's what it's geared towards um they're really a lot like you and i in the fact that they they want it about 65 degrees that's their ideal temperature um if it gets too hot they don't feel like doing anything if it gets too cold they they shiver and they eat a lot more but they burn a lot more yeah. calories they don't grow why are the roofs wavy yeah so <laughs> this so this wait? is plastic oh that's plastic yeah when we started building these buildings everything was steel and we put a steel ceiling in them and that really worked fine the only problem with steel was that especially where those inlets are that constant condensation your steel was wrong. would start to rust and then it would just get worse. So there is, each one of those heaters is 250,000 BTUs. So there's 750,000 BTUs uh, to a room. And these are actually, these are a variable output heater. So what's really nice about them is they, they know that they're supposed, they're supposed to start burning if the barn gets, say, two degrees below the target you're just trying to keep it at. Okay. So they'll start, and they'll start at maybe full capacity. They'll start at 250,000 BTUs. But as soon as they see that temperature move, and they realize that they don't have to work that hard, they'll start backing off on the gas, and they'll vary down to maybe 75,000, somewhere between 250 and 75,000. And then the other thing that's nice about these is they'll look at the temperature from all three sensors in the barn because there's a sensor beside each heater. And if the temperature, if the temperature from one end of the barn, what, is, what causes that? Just, just one like, does it, and it's like a, a random a reaction, a random sound that they're not used to. And it's just an and then everybody's alarm. like, yeah. That's amazing because it's like everybody does it like. Yeah. Instantaneously. That's yep. crazy. Or else they just voted. Yeah. One of the two. I don't know. <laughs> they voted. We like this. Yeah. <laughs> so. But if they see the temperature is too far off from one end of the bar to the other, they'll kick in like a, kind of like a stir fan. 
they'll start running without burning any gas just to move air to try to even the temperature out. So I'm sure that they're probably experimenting on being able to use some of the fumes coming from the manure to be able to heat the barn? There's, there's guys that have done that. Um, dairy is way ahead of hogs as far as using methane, but there's people that they're trying to figure it out but the price point's not there that's what it all comes down to and then the other thing that's weird about the the hog business is so i get paid the same whether i've got a heater like that or i have the heater that's like what we've used for the last 20 years okay. and it's like if i want to put bin scales on it Okay, it'd be nice for me to know how much feed's left in my bin, but it doesn't help me save any money on feeding the pigs, and I get paid the same. So, is the integrator going to pay for that, or am I going to pay for it? Well, if they're not going to pay me any extra for it, then I have to decide whether, if it saves me utilities, if it helps my barn last longer, or it saves me time chorn or doing some task, then I've got to weigh that out whether that's right for me. But if it helps the production of the pigs, but my integrator is not paying for it, then I'm probably not going to do it. And so there's that back okay. and forth all the time. So at least, so as a contract grower, you have to probably follow a certain set of rules by the grower that you're going for. And they can change those at the change of your contract? Yes. What's the length of a contract? So, today, most of the contracts are in this area are usually the same length as what a building loan is. Okay. So, 12 years. I don't know if they're doing, I don't. I take that back, because I don't think they're doing 15 year contracts. I think 12 years is about as long as they'll go. Okay. And it used to be, that, you know, it was a seven year yeah. note, so guys would do a seven year contract. Okay. So, um, pretty common 10 years. Now, if you go to Northwest Iowa, a lot of those guys are literally a term by term. Oh, really? And so, it is a different, it's a much different relationship, I would say, up there between contractors and growers because what the what the contractors demand. I think they're gonna have my overalls. Yet. They probably are. That's fine. <laughs> the the demands are a different. It's a different kind of relationship because you either do exactly what they want you to do, or they're not. You're not even gonna get another term. And so, so but it, then also, so you just said like a newer barn, older barn, probably shorter term stuff. Yeah. And yeah. older barns, it's like, might want to do the updates, like, hey, we're going to want to see different heaters in there exactly. and stuff like that. So yeah. that's where that's going. Yeah, you got to find that line of making your barn attractive enough to get a contract, but not spending too much. Not that it can't, that it won't cash. Yeah, it won't cash. Yeah. So do, the, do the contract growers, do they track your efficiency? Some do and some don't. I feel like we're definitely headed to that point. From a from an integrator side, there's so many variables that go into whether or not this is a profitable barn for them. And some of it comes down to, okay, how far am I from the people? How far am I from the packer where the pigs are gonna get? Oh, yeah. So all those things play into it because as transportation costs have gotten more expensive, it's like, you know, there's probably some growers that might not be the most efficient, but they're four miles from the feed. Yeah, so good. they're like, oh, that's, we need to keep that guy. Yeah. It's more about, do you, keep, do you keep the snow bladed? Do you keep the repairs done? Do you keep all that stuff? So there's a multitude of things that go into having a good relationship with your integrator. But I feel like with the technologists out there today, efficiency as far as, not just efficiency is how well you do race the pigs, but your efficiency as far as uh, power, water usage, all those things, because that's all stuff they're watching because their banker is worried about their ESG score. So they want, you know, I think the day's coming that- They're good. They gotta find out a way to track it better yeah. before, and once they do, they'll do it. Yeah. So like, why is farrowing to hog farmers like a swear word? 
Like it's like that is the play. I never ever want to do anything like that ever again. Well, Why is that? Because I grew up uh, youngest of three sons, and we farmed 160 acres, and we farmed 160 sows, and those 160 sows paid all our cars and all. You know, we grew up; it paid everything, and you could make a really good living off of farrowing and raising the pigs from those 160 sows. And then, about the time I was 16, we made the decision to add some more space and we went to like 240 sows. And then when I got out of high school, all I wanted to do was raise pigs. And I ended up buying a, a farm north of me and that guy had 120 sows fair to finish. And we moved everything around and put it all together and had 400 sows fair to finish. We thought we were, <laughs> we were really going places. And through that time, the margin of what you could make per head started getting squeezed. And 90, 92 hogs were really, really high. And they'd been working up uh, 90, 91, 92. And hog farmers were making record money. And you had a hell of a, that was when you still had a heck of a lot of people that were, you know, had 400 sows, 600 sows, 240 sows, a lot of people in the business. 90, 93, 94 came and markets started to climb. 95, 96 came and they got really bad. And it was the same time that we had a drought, we had a poor corn crop, corn went hot. So everybody got squeezed. And some guys got out um, and then 98 came. And 98 hogs were the lowest they've been dollar adjusted in I don't know how long. And people lost enough money that, you know, people lost their farms. And a lot of people that had stayed in and rode it up and down and up and down and up and down, just like us, we made the decision. You just couldn't, even when it came back, your costs had gotten high. And the health, we had started having all the health problems. You started having uh, PERS, and you started having PED, and you started having all that stuff. And it just, the money wasn't there. And so, you know, I kind of feel like my generation there, I was in my early 20s, I think there was a whole group of guys that got out and a lot of hard conversations about farrowing. And I went to town and got a job, you know, and we, we switched our buildings that we had. I sold the place that I bought and got out of that. And here at home, we converted our barns to finish it and we started custom feeding to somebody. But it wasn't enough money to keep both of us here. So I had to start working on farm. And I went, I went to work for a guy who was building these hog buildings. And I hated hog. I mean, I, I wanted nothing to do with it. My only thing was, I knew enough about fixing them and building them from what we had done that I could do that. And by 2000, I went to work for a company out of Wellman, and that was Precision, and they were, the, the building business, that's when the contract finished, was just going. Yeah. And I was traveling all over Southeast Iowa, fixing hog buildings, doing everything else, and, we had a salesman that quit, and I became a salesman. And through all of this, you know, we were lucky in the fact that we were still farming. We, did, we didn't lose the farm, and we still had the buildings, and but they were getting old. And in 2010, I kind of came full circle, and I decided these things work, so I built a building. My first building I built in 2010. So and for a lot of guys, it kind of put a floor under them where it's like, if I'm a contract grower, every year I can hit a base hit. Yeah. I go up the bat, I'm gonna hit a base hit. Yeah. I'm not gonna hit the home run, yep. but I can hit a base hit. Yep. But good news is, is that I'm not gonna go on a dry spell either or, yeah. or go yeah. backwards. So yeah. that's really what kinda got guys away from, uh, that ain't worth it for me anymore. Yeah. And, the, and the scale, because the guys that stayed in, you had to get to a point where 
you know, 400 thousand was, no, you had to be 1,200 thousand, 2,400 thousand, then you had to be 10,000 thousand, and today, and that's a lot of labor, a lot of labor, and you got it, you can't just, it's also that mentality, I was, I feel like I was kind of one of the last generations where my parents, my dad was that mindset of, if you just got up early enough and outworked everybody, you're going to be fine. It wasn't about, it wasn't necessarily about management or technology. It was, if you could physically outwork everybody else, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Well, that didn't work because when the margins, when nothing, swim. doesn't matter how hard you work, you're still losing money. And so to manage 5,000 sows versus 500 sows takes a whole different person. And there was not many guys that could do that. But the guys that did built the industry that we have today, pretty much. That makes sense. I, I've always wondered that. Is that like when you talk, you get hear guys talk about it, it's like never yeah. again type of thing. And so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it also was a, a we're, we're through that now because we talk about how expensive these buildings are. But, you know, when I was selling sheds, the hog building was the mortgage lifter because you had these guys that were farming six, seven hundred acres. Their kid, there wasn't enough there to keep their to bring their son, bring their daughter home. But you could build a couple of these sheds. You could pay, you could pay the, the son or daughter to chore, yeah. and they get equity. And in seven years, you had it paid for, and then they had an income, and they could afford to farm with you, and you could work on getting a, a transition plan. It was, they were fantastic for that because you, a whole a whole generation of people got started farming because of contract business. Which we're gonna go do their podcast, which is Barn Talk, and that's maybe something that we can talk about because what he just said was pretty much when I was coming back, that's what they were pushing hard, was put up hog barns, put up hog barns, put up hog barns, so. Can't do that today, no, nope. it won't work today. Nope. So now we're up in the Barn Talk barn. Barn. Yep. The Barn Talk Barn. Yep. Hayloft. We are going to be doing the podcast, so once again, all of their information is going to be linked down below. Check them out. Thanks, guys, for taking us around, showing us Pig Barn. I enjoyed it. I learned things. You know, it's like I'm kind of a geek for this type of stuff. So, podcast will come out soon. Check it out. I'll share it when it's up there. But thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll see you in the next one. Um. You can tell he's a pick If he goes right over the gate, I'm going to walk around him. I would like to say, I forgot to say this. Do you feel like the pigs are pretty clean? Yeah. That's a big misconception that I, that's probably our biggest comment we get all the time is people are like, wow, your pigs are so clean. Your pigs are so clean. How are they so clean? Well, you can kind of see here, they all like to shit and piss one place. Mm -hmm. And they all kind of want to like lay in one place. Even though that these pigs are kind of laying, they're kind of laying on the outside edge. They don't really like laying in their shit or piss. And so pigs are, they're really kind of clean animals. They don't like to really be dirty. And most of the time they all kind of poop and pee in one place and they kind of sleep in another. And they like to hang out in another. So. We're in here so we can might be messing up where they kind of lay. But. And that's maybe something too that like is a little bit difference between his social media is that I would very much so that they're egg fluencers or how do they call it? Advocates. Egg advocates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not necessarily, as a row cropper, we don't get attacked as much as livestock farmers, yeah. dairy farmers, holy smokes, you know, they just get put through the ringer. Um, but I think that might be because people see pigs waller in like yeah. shows and stuff but those pigs are wallering for sun protection yeah like their sun their skin can sunburn like ours does yeah. so they roll in the mud for a sun protectant yeah. if they didn't have to roll in the mud for sun protectant they're not going to roll in the mud for yeah. sun protectant. right it's really on us that more people haven't come out and showed how it actually is and so that's why we feel like what we're doing is important because we really do want to show people you know what it's actually like in the modern day mm -hmm. hog production. So we, we don't sugarcoat it. We show you what actually is going on. So that's what you get. <laughs>